In this lecture, we will be discussing receptors and drug receptor interactions. I'm going to start by laying out my definitions for each of the key terms. There is a lot of text on these next two slides, so I suggest you pause the video and read them in your own time. You are likely familiar with the idea that receptors can exist in an active conformation and an inactive conformation. What you might not know is that there is a degree of flux between those two states, even in the absence of agonist binding. This is relevant to the way that we define drug receptor interactions. Here we can see that there is a bit more going on than simply the drug binds a receptor and activates it. In this diagram, D is for drug, RI is for inactive unbound receptor, RID is for inactive bound receptor, RA is for active unbound receptor, RAD is for the active bound receptor. The arrows in bold indicate the direction in which an equilibrium will tend. Here we see that the drug has a higher affinity for the active form of the receptor, arrow big A little a, and we also see that the drug tends to stabilize the active conformation of the receptor, arrow K1 on the top right. Once you understand this diagram, a number of other things will make sense. Just for argument's sake, let's substitute footballer for drug. I used to think of a partial agonist as a full forward who is good at kicking goals, but not quite as good at, as Buddy Franklin in his heyday. It's probably more accurate to think of it as a full forward who is very good at kicking goals, but only some of the time. Likewise, I used to think of a competitive antagonist as a full back who kicks own goals, but it's probably more accurate to think of it as a player who simply gets in the way of the opposing forwards. A full agonist would be a player of your choosing in his heyday. An inverse agonist doesn't, ex doesn't exist in AFL because it is impossible to kick an own goal, at least not in a literal sense. Let's now flesh out the terms affinity, intrinsic activity, efficacy and potency. Affinity is, simply put, how tightly a drug will bind to its receptor. Regarding intrinsic activity, I think of this as a phenomenon pertaining to the individual drug molecule and its receptor, rather than a global response represented on a dose response curve. You may recall we defined intrinsic activity as a measure of the maximum level of response a drug can produce. It is expressed in relation to full agonist activity. That is, a full agonist has an intrinsic activity of one, a competitive antagonist has an intrinsic activity of zero, meaning that it does nothing but get in the way of the endogenous agonist. A partial, a partial agonist has an intrinsic activity of somewhere between zero and plus one, and an inverse agonist has an intrinsic activity somewhere between zero and minus one. Now let's discuss efficacy. I tend to think of efficacy as a phenomenon that describes the entire in vivo response rather than a single drug receptor interaction. You may recall we defined efficacy as a measure of the drug's propensity to elicit a response once bound to its receptor, and that is reflected by the height of a dose response curve. For example, if we look at the graph in the middle of screen, we can see that morphine has greater intrinsic activity than buprenorphine. Regarding potency, this is a measure of concentration of drug required to produce a given response. If we look at the graph on the left of screen and pretend for a moment that morphine and fentanyl have the same molecular weight, we would deduce that fentanyl is 100 times as potent as morphine. However, it's also the case that buprenorphine is more potent than morphine at, at some concentrations. You might recall that in the second part of the definition of potency, it was stated that it is a function of both affinity and efficacy. So, a 50 microgram dose of buprenorphine in an adult 
would probably have more of an opioid effect than 50 micrograms of morphine because buprenorphine has very, very high affinity for opioid receptors. It is, however, less efficacious overall. To summarize all this, good luck running Remy on your patient who is taking Suboxone. We will now briefly review the function of a couple of receptors important in anesthesia, namely the GABA-A receptor and the NMDA receptor. The GABA-A receptor is the target for most of the drugs that induce general anesthesia. Let's take propofol, for example. You may recall that propofol binds to the GABA-A receptor at its alpha-beta interface or something to that effect. The chloride channel opens, chloride influx occurs, and this results in hyperpolarization of the cell and an arrest of neurotransmission, right? Let me ask you this. What is the resting membrane potential for the neuron? The answer is minus 70 millivolts. Next, let me ask you this. What is the Nernst potential for chloride? Which is to say, what would the membrane potential be if all the chloride channels were to be open simultaneously? The answer is minus 60 millivolts. Has the penny dropped yet? The effect of propofol is to indeed open chloride channels, but the effect of this on a resting cell is to cause depolarization, not hyperpolarization, although it will not depolarize the neuron to its threshold potential. What probably happens is that propofol prevents any further depolarization by excitatory neurotransmitters. The next question is this. Why does midazolam cause anti-grade amnesia at subhypnotic doses while propofol does not? They both act at the GABA-A receptor, albeit with slightly different mechanisms. The answer is that there are several subtypes of the GABA-A receptor, and these receive differential expression across the regions of the brain. We might hypothesize that midazolam is having more of an effect at the hippocampus compared with propofol at subhypnotic doses. Now let's discuss the NMDA receptor. How is this receptor activated? Isn't it a glutamate receptor? The answer is, it takes a bunch of factors. First, the receptor must be primed, resulting in partial depolarization and removal of the magnesium plug. Next, the receptor must be bound by the coactivating neurotransmitter glycine. Only then may the receptor be activated by its endogenous ligand glutamate. Here is a simple explanation of what the NMDA receptor does. I've no doubt there's much more detail involved, but this was good enough for me. The important thing to understand is the, ro is the role of this receptor in the etiology of chronic pain. In the short term, repeated activation results in increased excitability of the receptor. In the long term, repeated activation results in synaptic reinforcement by inducing gene transcription, a process called long-term potentiation. This susceptibility to chronic pain is one of the prices that we pay for having the ability to learn. Lastly, I will leave you with a simple explanation of receptor theory for you to contemplate in your own time. This is a topic we are expected to understand to some degree, however, I haven't come across anybody who has been asked about it in an exam. I will finish by again listing those key terms and their definitions.